like to thank you all for coming. This is just a huge turnout, and we appreciate your interest in this topic today. I'd like to um, introduce Michelle Willett. She's a um, team member also of WorkWell. She's our small business coordinator. She also coordinates all of our businesses um, in consultation for wellness, for worksite wellness. And she's going to tell some of you here um, received a packet as you walked in, as you checked in, you are non-WorkWell members. So she's going to tell you about the benefits of WorkWell. And the rest of you who are WorkWell members, this is a little refresher for you. So thank you again for coming. And this is Michelle Willett. <laughs> thank you all for coming. I'm just going to briefly talk about some of our benefits since you're my captive audience for the next couple of minutes. So for those of you who have um, a packet and you're not sure what WorkWell is, we're a program of the Lincoln-Lancaster County Health Department. We just celebrated our 25th anniversary last year. And we are a worksite wellness council. Our area is southeastern Nebraska, and we are a membership organization. We have over 100 members. And um, some of our benefits are consultation. That's what I do with the businesses, help design a wellness plan for your business. Also, we have some turnkey resources that are available on our website, and those are incentive challenges and newsletters, other educational material that's all ready to go. You don't have to do any work. Also, we offer some networking benefits. We have an idea exchange in the fall where wellness coordinators or whoever is doing wellness at the businesses come with their best idea that they've done the past year and share that with everyone. So. It's a way to network with other businesses, other wellness coordinators, and get some great ideas for your programs for next year. We also offer some recognition. We have an annual banquet in the fall each year as well, and we have our companies nominate champions that they think have made a big difference in their own personal life or in the lives of others regarding wellness. And we also administrate the Governor's Award for Excellence in Wellness. We will be hosting a training on that on April 17th. It'll be a webinar or some sort of telehealth. We haven't quite decided, but you can learn more about how to apply for that award and the criteria for that. And finally, um, a little bit about our health risk appraisal. Um, actually, sorry, I forgot our meetings. This is one of them. We have them monthly. And um, last month, we had our tobacco cessation mentor training. And all of the people that attended got this great packet here, and it's a meeting in a box, basically everything that you would need to do to mentor a group of people who are interested in quitting tobacco use. So another thing that's really easy, you don't have to do any legwork on that as either. So back to the health risk, health risk appraisal. The uh, Live Well survey we designed with the ne Nebraska Department of Health and Human Services. It's a lot of words. Um, we've seen some great outcomes from the companies that take the HRA. And I want to talk a little bit about those. The companies have seen reduced absenteeism. In, in 2007, 81% of people said that they had missed work due to health. And in 2011, only 64% said that. So absenteeism reduction is a big benefit of a wellness program in addition to some reduction in health risk. We've seen people are at lower risk for diabetes, are not as stressed at work and have more normal cholesterol levels and have been screened for more um, diseases that can be prevented. And finally, on our survey, we ask women who are pregnant or planning to become pregnant how likely they would be to use a room to breastfeed or pump their breast milk. In 2007, 80% said yes, but in 2011, 100% of those women said yes. So. That's a, a great trend that we've been noticing, and we'll talk a lot more about that today. So thank you again for coming. I'd like at this time to recognize our sponsors, MilkWorks, uh, WorkWell, Department of Health and Human Services, Nebraska Women's Health Advisory Council, Nebraska, and Nebraska Breastfeeding Coalition. And in special recognition, I'd like to recognize Workplace Breastfeeding Support Work Group, the panelists here today, Emeritus for um, coordinating this space and providing this space, Lincoln Human Resource Management Association, and then I'd like to thank the Nebraska Department of Labor. Um, thank you so much. And with that, I'd like to introduce Holly Dingman. She's the Nutrition Coordinator from the Nebraska Department of Health and Human Services. To 
uh, get our program going here. Thank you and welcome um, to this inaugural event. Um, I'm really excited to see everyone here and um, what an awesome turnout. I'd first like to bring a little bit of recognition to the bright lights and cameras that are here. For those of you who are, wonder who are wondering, it's City, City TV, um, the 10 Health uh, channel is here filming our event today so that it can be um, offered, uh, aired at another time, it won't be live, um, aired at another time on, on Channel 10 Health and also available on YouTube and we'll see how else we can get it to other parts of Nebraska um, that um, may not have in-person events like this but could benefit from this information. Um, so as I said, the, this is really an inaugural event to bringing together uh, businesses, workplace wellness, and public health to talk about the role um, of the federal law in support of nursing moms and, and all of us here today. Hopefully you'll walk away um, understanding the law better, um, m connecting uh, how this why the health department, why the uh, state health department, the local health department, and nationally we're talking about this, um, have some resources for you and a chance to network. So the big picture is um, breastfeeding has been getting a lot of um, attention in public health lately. And you'll learn more about the Fair Labor Act that was amended in March of 2010 to include a provision to um, have employees, employers support workplace accommodations. That was followed up in January of 2011. Uh, the Surgeon General, Dr. Regina Benjamin, put for, forward a call to action uh, in support of breastfeeding, recognizing that it's really beyond the mother's choice. It's the whole um, community, including um, family, uh, workplace, healthcare, um, that supports uh, breastfeeding. Everyone can make breastfeeding easier. That was the Surgeon General's uh, message. We also have a state plan that was recently revised by um, public health professionals across the state, the Nebraska Physical Activity and Nutrition State Plan. Breastfeeding is one of the three key areas that is um, um, brought forward in that state plan. And it contains four strategies to increasing breastfeeding support, and one is around work sites. With uh, over a quarter of a, a million um, working moms who are of childbearing age in Nebraska, it's a really great target group. Um, as uh, uh, breastfeeding is one of the most effective preventative measures um, that a woman can take to protect her health and the health of her infant. And it's really the first intervention for child obesity prevention. That's really the why behind it, the connection. I just want to briefly go over, um, one thing I didn't, we didn't figure out is advancing the slides. Sorry, Ann. Perfect. Oh. So just to see where our breastfeeding rates are, um, three in four women is try breastfeeding. They start out breastfeeding. But by three months, only one in three women is exclusively breastfeeding. And by six months, half are even continuing, and less than one in seven are meeting the American Academy of Pediatrics recommendations of exclusive breastfeeding for six months. So returning to work is an important intervention point that we can help support moms um, in their decision to continue uh, to breastfeed. In 2010 and 2011, the Nebraska Department of Health and Human Services conducted a survey of businesses about 1,500 businesses responded, and what we found is that one in four businesses offer a space, one in three offered flexible break times, and one in 10 had an actual policy supporting breastfeeding. So with that, there's really great opportunity for all of us to have this conversation and see how we can, um, in our own work sites, improve the support for our nursing moms. 
This event is one in three activities that will be happening in 2012. Hopefully we'll have more return to work events for businesses occurring across the state. Uh, the Department of Labor and Department of Health and Human Services is working on putting together a mailing for businesses, um, bringing education and awareness to them. And the Nebraska Breastfeeding Coalition, in support with the Women's Health Advisory Council, is working on a breastfeeding recognition program. So you will probably hear more about that as the year rolls on. But with that. I'm going to pass uh, the mic over to um, Ann Seacrest, who is the Executive Director of Milkworks, Lincoln's um, premier community breastfeeding center. Ann will be facilitating our discussion today. I'm going to mention who they are right now, and then I'll reintroduce them when they're ready to talk. But um, we have Adam Prohaska with us, who's an attorney with Harding & Schultz. We have Sherry Wimes, who's Vice President of Human Resources at Emeritus. Sarah Payne, who is the Wellness Coordinator at Telcor. Carrie Saunders-Jones is an employee at Cedars. And Carmen Bockel, am I pronouncing that right, is a paralegal at the Department of Health and Human Services. And Liz Ring Carlson is a public affairs manager at State Farm. So I want to welcome our panelists and thank you for taking time to come here today. I want to acknowledge that some of you in this room have been doing a lot for breastfeeding mothers in the workplace for many years. And, and before there was anything to comply with, you were complying and you were doing, you've been doing it beautifully. I really see you as role models in our community. You are the businesses, you are the employers that have been doing this and can really talk to other businesses that are putting their putting their step their foot forward to try and comply with the new regulations. So thank you what you're doing. Please continue to share what you're doing. Um, both in the worksite um, venue, but also as you just talk to other people in the community. We really need you doing that. For those of you that this is new for your business and you're wanting to comply, you're wanting to figure out how you can do this better, please feel free to ask questions of other businesses that are here today. And also, there's an insert in your packet. If you would complete it and fill it out before you leave today, it just asks for your name, your business, whether you currently have a policy or not. What we'd like to do is be able to develop a resource list that we can provide you with, and we'll do that through WorkWell. There's also, some of you will find there's a little colored sticker in your packet. If you have one of those, it's just a little a thing that looks like this. Please stop by the desk on your way out today. We have a little door prize for you to put in your lactation room. So uh, uh, make sure that you pick that up. So what is the impact on babies um, when we help their mothers continue to breastfeed when they return to work? And I want you to know, for some of you, there's going to be a little bit of TMI today, a little bit of too much information. But we want you to understand, for those of you that have never breastfed a baby or have not been around this, what does this mean when a mom needs a pump break? Um, so the the... What we always tend to look for first is what is the best research that we have on breastfeeding and its impact. And we tend to go to what we feel is the best resource, which is a meta-analysis that was done in 2007. And it looked at 9,000 research studies and tried to figure out what are the best studies, what can we truly say about feeding babies human milk. We know there's association with IQ. We know there's association with decreased child abuse, decreased postpartum depression. But what can we truly say from research? And these are the things that we truly feel that we can say may are, have, are significantly impact by how babies are fed. We have less ear infections, less stomach infections, less respiratory tract infections, less dermatitis, less asthma in young children, Lifetime decreased risk of obesity, which is epidemic in our state, as well as decreased type 1, type 2 diabetes. Childhood leukemia, four times decrease in SIDS, sudden infant death syndrome, and necrotizing enterocolitis, which I can't believe I said it. Um, it basically impacts premature babies. We also know that mothers who breastfeed have decreased type 2 diabetes, 
and breast and ovarian cancer. These are significant impacts on, on the health of our culture. As a result, as Holly mentioned, this US Surgeon General has recommended exclusive human milk for six months, continue for at least 12 months. So this is really all about the health of our babies. This is who we're talking about here right now. But the amazing thing is, these kids are gonna go grow up to be your employees of tomorrow. Okay, so that's one of the reasons why we really care that these kids have, have a leg up on their health. What's the impact on all of us? Improved health status. We all are impacted when, when we have a greater level of health, a higher level of health. We have a more productive workforce when people are not missing days. We have lower health care costs, which we know is a huge issue in our country right now. Tax saving for food supplement programs. Low-income women who access WIC programs, when they breastfeed, we all save money as taxpayers because they are basically feeding their babies free food instead of us paying for formula for them to feed their babies. Less financial stress for parents. Formula t starts at about probably 1,500, 1,800. Really, many parents will end up paying seven to $8,000 because their babies cannot tolerate a regular formula. Um, one thing I wanna add in here is the environmental impact. Um, when we don't have an industry that's consuming natural resources and manufacturing formula, and then we're disposing of formula containers. Instead, we're using free food that was provided in mom's body. That's a huge green impact on our country. Decreased turnover in the workforce. Um, a mom called two days ago. She heard about this workshop. She said, I went back to work last weekend. My employer told me I'd have a break. I had a six hour shift, no break, I quit. Less absenteeism in the workplace. So if you're not a breastfeeding employee, but someone else is, and they don't miss as much work, that helps you out because you don't have to carry their load. Greater job satisfaction. And you're gonna hear some of that from the moms that are here today that are employees. Um, I'm gonna turn it over now to Adam Prohaska, who's an attorney with Harding and Schultz. He's gonna actually walk us through what this new amended F FLSA looks like. You can go from there, Adam. Is this on? Okay. Um, first of all, I'm slated for 10 minutes, and if you know any attorneys, it's going to be hard. It's hard for any of us to do anything in 10 minutes, but I'm going to try. Um, I may be stolen a couple minutes from um, somebody else as well. So, um, this, uh, the, the provision that we're talking about in the Fair Labor Standards Act is relatively new. It was part of the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act. Um, we probably all know about that act because of the individual mandates, which has gotten all of the attention. And in fact, you're gonna hear more about that next week because that, those individual mandates go before the Supreme Court. But part of that, um, that law was, is what we're here talking about today. Um, and uh, it, it is new, I mean, it's, this is March of 2010, but in the legal world, it's extremely new. Um, you know, we don't have court decisions to uh, tell us how we interpret this, this law. So really what we're left with is the language of the law. Um, and so my intention is to go through this step by step so we understand, well, what does the law provide? And there are gonna be lots of unknowns. Uh, we're gonna talk about some of the significant unknowns at the end. Uh, but the first, the first provision of this law is, is a reasonable break time for in, an employee to express breast milk for her nursing child. Um, what is reasonable? I don't know. We don't know what reasonable is. We do know that it is reasonable time for an employee to do that. Um, the law does not mandate if that's 15 minutes, 20 minutes, 30 minutes. I think that is a, that, that's to be decided on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, that nursing break is to be provided for one year after the child's birth. It's not one year after the mother returns from her FMLA leave, but it's one year from the, the child's birth. Um, and that break needs to be provided each time the employee has a need to express milk. Again, the law doesn't provide us with 
any indication as to how many times a day that is. Uh, so that's really left to everybody else here to, to tell you how long that is. And, that, and, and the unknowns, at least in this first paragraph, really, I guess it's important that there is an open conversation between the employer and the employee to determine what's best and how this is going to go forward. And if the employer and employee have this open discussion early on, um, then we don't have to worry about a lot of these things because we have created a plan and we know what's going to happen. Um, the second paragraph here is, is where the lactation room, or, or what, what is required, what, what type of lactation room is required. And the first six words or so, a place other than a bathroom, I'm going to say that again, a place other than a bathroom. And I'm, I'm emphasizing this because even in the March 8th article uh, in the Journal Star that told us all about this luncheon, there's a comment that talks about, oh, just, you know, it, it works fine, just leave your breast pump in the bathroom. Well, bathrooms are off limits. This has to be a separate space. Um, and I'm going to call it a private space because the space has to be shielded from view and free from intrusion from coworkers and the public. It just, it needs to be private. It needs to give that nursing mom privacy. Um, the law doesn't say if it needs to be permanent or temporary. In fact, uh, some of the regulations and the fact sheets that have been uh, released after this was passed, do, it, it does allow a temporary location. But that temporary location or the permanent location always needs to be available. And, and just a quick example, if a, nurse, if a nursing mom needs to, to pump and that room is full with a meeting or something else, that's not acceptable. That room needs to be available each time she has a break. The third paragraph deals with compensation. Um, it, it says a, an employer is not required to compensate an employee. Uh, I wish it was that simple. Uh, this you know, says, well, an employer doesn't have to compensate, but if we kind of think about this further, um, if you have a morning and an afternoon break and a lunch hour, it may be that you can set up nursing breaks during those breaks or during that lunch hour. So in fact, you know, there's, you, you can set it up so maybe they are compensated at least for the breaks. Now, the other big question there is if what happens if an employee only works seven and a half hours a day because of nursing breaks? Is an employer required to just pay them seven and a half hours for that day? What if, it, what if they only work 37 or 38 hours a week? And, and I guess I don't know the answer to that. Um, you know, can an employer make that employee work an extra two or three hours to make up and bring them up to 40 hours? Possibly. Um, this is, again, open conversation between the employer and the employee to determine how this is going to be handled. Um, another thing with compensation is uh, we all know that if an employee is doing work, um, then that employee needs to be compensated. Break times need to be break times. Um, you're not doing work at that time. If the nursing mom is multitasking and making phone calls or reviewing documents, it may be that that's a paid break. You know, that's another thing to think about. Um, the fourth paragraph deals with who is, which employers have to comply with this, uh, comply with this provision. Um, and it says, an employer that employs less than 50 employees shall not be subject to the requirements if the requirements impose an undue hardship. And then it specifies sort of a, a balancing test after that. Um, so if you have more than 50 employees, you have to do this. If you have less than 50 employees, I, I still think you have to do this unless the employer can meet this burden. The way that this statute's uh, written, according to the way I'm interpreting it, is that the employer must show it's an undue burden. The employer has to come forth and say, listen, we just can't do it um, because of the size, financial resources, nature of our business, but that is an employer burden. Um, so it, it gets difficult if you're going to say no and you're less than 50 employees. The 
the last provision uh, simply states that nothing in this section shall preempt a state law from providing greater protection. Um, really irrelevant in Nebraska because Nebraska does not provide nursing moms with extra workplace protections. Um, so this is subject in, or, or used in some other states, but not here in Nebraska. The, a couple of interesting, really interesting parts of this is that the nursing requirements are stuck in, and I'm, I'm, I told myself I wasn't going to use numbers, but it's stuck in 29 U.S.C. 207R. Okay, 207R is the provision in the Fair Labor Standards Act that requires employers to pay employees for time and a half above 40 hours a week. Okay, so it limits the, the work week to 40 hours, and it says if you work over 40 hours, you have to pay time and a half. But we all know that that only applies to hourly employees. You know, if you're an exempt or salaried employee, 207R doesn't apply to you. So does that mean if you have a salaried employee, you don't have to follow this? That's going to be an argument. Um, but I, l l let me give you a quick example on why I think that argument would fail. And, and that is if you have a salaried employee working directly next to an hourly employee, and both of these employees are pregnant at the same time, both have their baby, both come in and say, we want a nurse. Is it fair that an employer gets to say, yes, we'll give you a room, we'll give you breaks, go have it, you know, go, go, go to your pump room? No, we don't have to provide this salaried employee with anything. So if you think about it that way, it doesn't make sense that it would apply only to hourly employees. But that's, again, we don't know. It's an unknown, undecided issue at this point. Um, another issue that's going to come up at some point is what is reasonable and, and how often do you have to provide breaks. Some employers um, are taking the position that there's a balancing test as to what is reasonable. And you have to balance the employee's right to express milk with the employer's right to have that employee work and to do certain things. A perfect example is, uh, you know, the only thing I can think of right off the top of my head is a school. Um, you know, if you teach periods one, two, three, and then you have your fourth period is, is an open period and then five, six, you know, an employer may say, well, I know you need to do this every three hours, but can we stretch and move you into your open period so we don't have to have a substitute teacher come in? Um, I don't know how that's going to play out. It, it, it's, it, you know, the statute is what we have. The statute doesn't have a balancing test in it. it, it it's something that the courts are going to have to decide at some point. Um, violations. If, you, if an employer is caught violating this provision, uh, Section 207 doesn't provide a specific violation or a penalty, but we are subject to all of the other workplace penalties. Um, that, that you may be aware of. An employee can file a complaint with the Department of Labor. Uh, Department of Labor can seek injunctive relief. If an employee is terminated, you can seek reinstatement. Um, there could be retaliation claims. Um, if you treated that employee different than a non-nursing employee, you could fall under Title VII. And in fact, this law ties in very closely with Title VII and sex discrimination, because sex discrimination specifically includes um, childbirth and things associated with childbirth. <clears throat> and, uh, and I will say that the Lincoln Commission on Human Rights has already decided one case where an employee he has alleged that she was terminated because of, of um, not being provided nursing breaks, and the, the commission found in her favor. So this is something that is going to start happening if employers and employees uh, don't take this seriously. So sort of the summary, I don't know if I'm where I'm at in my, my time, but um, you, you know, if I can stress anything today, it would be to open up a dialogue have a conversation, 
get the employer and the employee on the same page and understand what's going to happen and create a plan. Um, can we entertain any real specific questions for Adam right now? He did a great job. Yes. Well, this is, this, this is part of the information that I wanted to share with you today because it is information not everybody understands, and that is how are these, you know, why are these accommodations actually needed and what do they look like? Um, you know, uh, we're a room full of women mostly here, but yet still this is not a topic we, t we talk about easily, even women to women, much less women to men in the workplace setting. So it can have an element of discomfort along with it. Many countries accommodate breastfeeding with longer maternity leaves. However, here in Lincoln, in Lancaster County, we see women returning at very varying lengths. We see some women returning very early after giving birth. Um, the earlier, the more challenging it's going to be for a mom when you talk about accommodating for breastfeeding because she's recovering from giving birth, possibly from having abdominal surgery along with that birth. She's adjusting to a new role as a mother, be it the first time or second time, and she's also serving as the primary food source for her newborn baby. So she's got a lot on her plate, particularly if she's returning to work very soon after giving birth. So one of the reasons why they don't specify the number of breaks and the lengths of brace, breaks is that babies feed about six to 10 times in 24 hours. They tend to feed less as they get older. And what happens is that it also is dependent upon the storage capacity of a mother. Women store different amounts of milk in their breasts. So we may have a mom who stores very small amounts of milk in her breast. And so what happens is when her baby is breastfeeding, her baby breastfeeds quite frequently, 10 times a day. We may have another mom who stores five to six ounces in her breast. Her baby very quickly may move to taking very large feeds fewer times. So she may actually be down to feeding her baby five to six times a day in 24 hours. And what happens is when a woman goes back to work, she replaces those feedings at the breast with a pumping. And that's why we get that variation of the number of times that she needs to pump, because every mom and baby are different. And what we have to do is accommodate to what her need is. And some women do need to pump frequently in order to maintain their milk supply. Or their hormones say, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not nursing anymore, I don't need to make milk. The other thing that happens is that, um, and so dwindling supply is a really big issue. The other thing that happens is some women, a pump is like second nature to them. They sit down with a pump, they put the pump on, we're going to talk about that a little bit, and they start pumping, and five, seven minutes, that milk's out, they're done. Other moms, because of the hormonal factor, we always say, if we had two things, we could make a zillion bucks. One is a little switch that went, and the milk comes out, because it doesn't work that way. It's a hormonal thing that let, helps let the milk out. And the other is a little window that said how much is in there, okay? We don't have either of those things. So, so there is a varying thing. Other women, the pump, it ta it's, a, it's hard for them to let down to that pump. Relaxation is really important. I think Sarah's going to talk about what, what they're doing in their work site to help um, facilitate that. So those are two issues that go on there. And I don't know if that answers, but that's the closest answer that I can come to there. Um, any other questions for Adam? Yes. It requires a private space it, when you need one. At least that's my interpretation of it. But if you have, empl if you have nursing moms at each branch, I think it's going to be pretty difficult for you to say that, well, it's reasonable for you to leave your branch and go to the downtown branch to, to pump. That just, I don't know that that's going to work from a logistical standpoint. Um, and so if you have nursing moms in five branches all at the same time, you know, you may have to have rooms at five branches unless, you know, the employee, unless you and your employees can, can come up with other, some other arrangement. Maybe you can shift them 
to a, the same job in a different branch. I right. guess I don't know. That, that may be possible. It may not. A, a very unusual story is there was a young mom several years ago who worked at the penitentiary, and she was going to wean at six weeks because she said, nobody, nobody pumps at the penitentiary. It's unheard of. And she, said, and it, she got to six weeks, and she said, I don't want to wean. I don't want to stop this. I need to keep breastfeeding. And so she went to her supervisor, and they said, you can use the bathroom. And she said, <laughs> We don't use the bathroom even at the penitentiary. I mean, we don't even want to use the bathroom as a bathroom at the penitentiary. And the warden at that time said, heck, I'm never in my office. You can have my office. So that's part of that, that creative flexibility that it needs to be a private space so that nobody can see her. She feels like nobody's going to intrude upon her. But sometimes it may just be creative solutions as to where is that empty space. says that if you have to provide the break when the nursing mom needs the break okay. um, so you know it's it's gonna yeah. be hard for you to say no you can't do it for four hours I mean it you know if there's an agreement between you and the employee and that will work I mean we have also have to think about the ultimate goal here I and mean, the ultimate goal is to encourage breastfeeding it's to encourage um, moms to not lose their milk supply and if you you know, and maybe can address this better than I can, but if you wait, you know, too long, then all of a sudden we're defeating the, the purpose of why we have the law in the first place. So, yes, it is, this is going to change the work site a little bit. There's no doubt about it. Okay, we're going to kind of, we're going to keep moving on. That doesn't mean you can't come back to questions for Adam. Um, let's look real quickly at what a pump break looks like. Um, there are two types of pumps that moms tend to use when they're back at work. One of them is what we call a hospital grade um, rental pump. Rents for about $70 a month. The purchase is about $2,000. Some employers will choose to purchase one of these pumps and have it on site so that a mom does not need to bring a pump to work with her. That's a great saving, that's a great convenience for a mom. What the mom then does is she purchases or her employer provides her with her own kit for the pump, which is at the cost of about $50 for the kit. Other moms will choose to bring their own pump, which is called a single user electric pump. And they basically uses a very similar type kit. This pump will cost about two to $300. And these are designed for single user meaning one, mom's, one mom uses this pump. It's not designed to be shared among different mothers because of the type of um, system it is. Whereas the rental pump can be used by multiple users. That's the basic equipment that a mom will use. What a mom needs to be able to do is she needs to be able to create a private space where she is or move to a private space, wash or clean her hands, in a sink or with a, a wet wipe, assemble her pump parts, which basically means taking the pump parts, putting them onto the pump, pumping for at least five to 20 minutes. Again, it goes back, some moms can pump in five minutes. Some moms are gonna take 20 minutes because of the letdown, the relaxation factor involved in it. She needs to disassemble the parts, preferably clean the parts, put her milk into a cooler bag, or a refrigerator. Milk is very durable, does not spoil easily. It can really sit out at room temp for six hours, but most moms will put it in a cooler because of that safety factor, and then get back to her job. So that's, that's what happens during a pump break. Um, I'm going to move on at this point and um, uh, get to the two employers that we have here and have Sherry and Sarah talk a little bit about what they've done in their work environment to make this work for their employees. Thank you, Ann. Can everybody hear me? Okay. Well, I want to thank you, first of all, for joining us here at Emeritus for this important event. And I can personally attest to the importance of providing support for breastfeeding moms. I was a mother who chose to, to feed my children that way, and my daughters and daughter-in-laws have chosen that as well. Corporate support, as well as community support for women who are breastfeeding, is vital to the health of our newborns and to the physical and mental health of our mothers. On a personal note, in 2006, my daughter gave birth to her first child. 
a very wonderful, beautiful son. Of course, I'm a proud grandmother. Um, and he was very healthy. He was, he was doing really well. Unfortunately, she experienced severe postpartum depression. Through the support of many community organizations, she was able to continue nursing her son and eventually go back to school and go back to work. And she overcame the postpartum depression. Knowing that we could call on organizations and the caring professionals at Milkworks, particularly Anne, thank you Anne, was critical to me and, and so important and I will never ever forget that experience and knowing that those resources were out there for us. I also, at that time, worked for Emeritus and I had the benefit of a very supportive employer that allowed me to take the time off I needed to to support my daughter and my new grandson. But we're here to talk about Emeritus and what we do for breastfeeding moms. Emeritus recognized or has been recognized as one of the 100 best companies for working mothers numerous occasions, and we're very proud of that. The early recognition that we received from the Working Mother Organization was largely due to the proactive support that we do provide to mothers who are returning to the workforce. Uh, one of the questions that we were asked is how, does, how do we facilitate or accommodate associates who are breastfeeding? Way back in 1990, as Ann indicated, a lot of companies here in Lincoln were pretty proactive. We created our first lactation rooms at our various locations. In 1995, we actually added breast pumps, the type that Ann is talking about. And currently, we have three lactation rooms in this building. We have about five to 600 employees here. We have a Fallbrook location that has about 400 employees, and we have three lactation rooms there, and we provide pumps in two of each of those uh, locations. Well, two pumps in each location. Our emeritus managers are pretty proactive in learning about what the law says in terms of their responsibilities and what they need to do to accommodate mothers during the workday so that they can meet, in, meet their lactation needs. We have a formal nursing policy, nursing mother's policy, which I'm a little nervous with Adam sitting here because I know he's going through the checklist of have we complied with everything, so we'll talk <laughs> afterwards. Uh, we do have a nursing policy and it does provide parameters around the number of breaks that our mothers can take during the work day. And also it describes the kind of facilities we have, what's in our lactation rooms. We do allow mothers to take four breaks. Three of those are, well, they're all paid breaks. One of those breaks is their lunch break. Uh, we generally say about 20 minutes per break, but again, I think the flexibility and the reasonableness question has to be something that's discussed between the employer or our associate and their manager. Due to the number of nursing moms, and there definitely has been an increase. <laughs> uh, we are, the biggest challenge that I think we face as an employer is, is what I've already heard in terms of questions, and that's really finding the space available and making sure that our nursing, nursing moms have that privacy and the time available when they need it. So what we've done because of the number of nursing moms we have is we have created a scheduling process. So there's a sign up sheet on the door and mothers can go in and, and sign up for their times during the day so that there's a little bit of order there and they're not overlapping uh, with one another. Emeritus has also strived to create a diverse leadership team. Our CEO is female, that's Joanne Martin. 63% of our workforce is comprised of women, so we take creating a family-friendly culture very, very seriously here. We also provide support for our new dads. We recently implemented a new parent leave policy that provides for up to 10 days of paid leaves, paid leave for birth mothers for fathers and for domestic partners of birth mothers. And we're proud of that as well, trying to increase our, our family-friendly culture here. The best advice that I could provide to employers is really what's already been stated here, and that's the communication process between the manager and the mom. And really asking that nursing mother, what's, what do they need to continue their nursing while they're returning back to work? It's also important to recognize that not all breastfeeding experiences are the same. We've already heard about the differences between five minutes versus 20 minutes in terms of the need. So again, hard and fast rules, although we have a policy, there's got to be flexibility from an employer standpoint in working with our associates. Um, we did ask several of our associates at Emeritus if they would provide a, a few statements. 
about their experience here, and I'm just going to share some of those very briefly. But Lindsay shared that management has always been very supportive by giving me time away from my desk multiple times a day to pump. Now that I have a new three-month-old baby boy, I hope to be able to nurse him his first year too. Stacy said, working for an employer that offers a clean and private facility for a nursing mother helped to make the transition back to work much easier. And finally, Tracy shared, it's a huge time commitment. So by allowing us break times to express milk without having to make that time up is really important. It allows me more time with my children while providing what is best for my baby. So our philosophy at Emeritus really is that happy mothers are productive and valuable employees, and we absolutely want to retain them. So any questions about Emeritus policies? OK, thank you. Okay, I'm going to be covering some of the same questions that Sherry did here. Um, although Telcor is on a much smaller scale than what Emeritus is. We have just under 100 employees. Um, we would fall under most of our employees being in that exempt status. We have just a handful that are non-exempt, although our executives had decided to make mandate our company to follow the um, amended law that went in place. So that is what the changes that we went ahead and made. Um, anytime we have a new mother returning to work that has decided to breastfeed, we go ahead and make sure that they understand they have full support from um, the entire company, that no harassment of any kind, no remarks will be tolerated whatsoever from coworkers. If they ever feel uncomfortable about walking away, carrying their pump, anything like that, that needs to be reported because those are types of things that will make a woman feel less comfortable about pumping in the workplace. Um, we go over our policy and procedure with them and their manager. Uh, <clears throat> we want to make sure that everybody fully understands what's expected and the whole idea of what a reasonable break time gets brought up again, or reasonable expectations. Um, for us, our reasonable expectation more revolves around they can leave their desk, they can go do their pump as much as they need to. Um, the reasonable expectation is that they just fulfill their job duties and responsibilities, that it doesn't um, take away so much from what they're being asked to do and, and become the, a burden on some of the other employees because of how our company is set up. We have um, a large amount of small departments, and so there can be a department of just four or five employees. And so if one person has to go and pump four or five times a day, that's fine. We also don't expect them to use their lunch. We never ask anybody to use their lunch. They don't need to eat and pump. That's also adding stress to somebody because then they're trying to hurry through their lunch. They're trying to hurry through the rest of their day. Um, as far as our privacy goes, we did have one room that was kind of a shared meeting room. And the expectation was if somebody was in there, you had to get out when you saw the mom walking up with her pump. And several moms got really good at that. They'd even kick out the president and he, he'd get out <laughs> real quick. He had no problem with it. So, but we came to understand that um, after having a focus group with past nursing moms present and then some that are expecting, um, a couple were a little uncomfortable with where the room was actually located in the building because they had to walk directly past our male HR director and it was kind of like this parade of, okay, and then also, where the desk was located, they kind of were uncomfortable. They thought he could hear everything going on in the room. So that was, that was a barrier for them. And so we wanted to take that away. So we went and searched around for which room we could transfer it to and found a different room. And so we are in the process of switching rooms and it will be a dedicated room for that purpose only. And um, we have, there's a window right next to the door. So there's blinds on there. There's an interior lock that we placed on the door and also have a sign on the outside that has the slider on there. So it says um, whether or not it's, uh, it's an open or closed room. So that way it provides kind of one more visual 
to people so they don't reach for that door handle because if anybody ever has been nursing or pumping, if you were to be in a locked room, especially in your workplace, exposed and you heard somebody jiggle the handle, that might make you jump. So we wanted to prevent that from happening. So we have the slider there that they can do. Um, scheduling was also a big hardship for us because we have employees that do service and support. They work with customers. So we can have them schedule their time in our, we just use like Outlook Manager to schedule our meetings and block rooms. And that's what they would do. The unfortunate thing is somebody might schedule the time for 10 o'clock and then all of a sudden they're on the phone with a customer and it's 10.45 and they completely missed the time in the room. They get down there and somebody else is in there. So there has to be some sort of flexibility with that that we have to understand that we can't make it so rigid for them. You know, so the people that have certain job responsibilities within the co company actually get first dibs is how it works. So then the other ones that don't just kind of understand that their daily schedule is a little bit more flexible and so they kind of work around that and everybody's very supportive of the way that works because um, we always want to make sure we get our customer support happy as well. So, And um, I think... The other thing is we put in our room, we uh, put in a nice big comfy chair, and it's, uh, it's a recliner. It doesn't look like a recliner, it's, but we wanted that option, so if moms wanted to kick up their feet, and I've even told them if they wanted to sneak in a nap, they could. They're new moms. I wouldn't tell on them. Um, and then we have a compact refrigerator in there, and also storage uh, lockers that are there for if they want to just in the mornings come in and bring their pump and put it in there. That way they don't have to carry it around the building all day. We have looked into getting a closed circuit unit for the company. Like it, we are small though, so, but at one point we were going to have three moms nursing, so we're weighing the options. Uh, and the other thing is for um, helping the moms relax during that time is making sure there's uh, some sort of white noise buffer. So they can't hear what's going on in the hallway. And also we have lots of artists that work with us and so we're going to be exhibiting um, local photography from some of our photographers at work to help just give them something to look at and just help with the whole visual so it's not such a clinical space. So. The different rooms here. Um, because you guys have done a great job kind of explaining what you've done in your rooms. These are some other places um, around the state. Um, uh, the lactation rooms at the state office building. Grand Island, and I think Jane here from Grand Island, this is her room. Box Butte General Hospital and Clinics. Greater Omaha Chamber of Commerce. Omaha UNL Extension Office. One of the things I mentioned to Sherry that's great for decor in a lactation room is just put up a bulletin board and let moms put pictures of their babies on it. Um, these are a couple different layouts. You have all this information in your packet, but you can see. Um, I noticed one of the things that um, Sherry at Emeritus the moms face away so that if someone were to walk in, they have some privacy just by facing away, facing into the space rather than facing out of the space. Um, go to the next one real quick, Holly. And um, Sarah had mentioned some of the other amenities that sometimes are provided beyond a table, um, a, ch uh, a table, a chair, a private space, and a lock on the door. These are some of the other things that are oftentimes provided a clock, um, music or white noise, uh, running water, a refrigerator, um, sign-up sheet, computer terminal, educational resources. So just some other options that can be included in the room. But keep in mind, even the really basic space is great. Sarah. Uh, I just wanted to add, because we wanted to find out what would make it easier for women, we did find out with the sign-ups, because I noticed one of the signs said lactation room. Um, 
the majority of the moms that when I had a meeting with actually did not want it to say lactation room on the outside of the door. They felt more comfortable if it just had the regular room number on there. Okay. Uh, so that just was something that I found interesting that they just did not want the announcement of what they were doing in there. So, mm -hmm. we off, Those of us that work in the lactation breastfeeding field, we have to realize that not everybody has that comfort level that we do about talking about this. And it will, the in, comfort level will increase as we talk more. But until we get there, we need to be very sensitive of that. I'm going to, thank you, Sarah and Cherry both. I'm going to move on to Carrie. All right. Well, I'm employed by Cedars and had worked there for 10 years before my daughter was born in August of 2010. And her name is Willa Scout. <laughs> we do call her Willa. Someday, hopefully, we'll call her Scout when she learns her first name. <laughs> um, and one of the things that I want to mention is my experience with Milk Works. I was dead set on breastfeeding and didn't know until I went to my two-week uh, checkup for my daughter and she hadn't gained any weight. So I felt so guilty that I was starving my child, not realizing that my supply hadn't come in. So I was referred to Milk Works and had a great experience there. But after I dedicated all this time, I feel that nursing was one of the hardest things that I ever did in my life. And once I had overcome that barrier, by God, I was going to do it at work. I was going to make it to six months. When I made it to six months, I was doing it till one year. And I, as I mentioned earlier, had worked at Cedars for 10 years. We're a very family-focused organization. And I had seen over the years many, many moms nurse. So I knew it was my right to be able to do it at work. I knew that they supported me. I knew that it wasn't anything anyone was going to question when I made that a part of my work schedule. So um, in terms of what they provided for me was the history of seeing what has happened within the organization as well as I have a private office. So luckily I was fortunate enough to just close the door when I needed to pump. Um, I also had invested in one of those corset garment things that they have at Milk Works, so I was hands-free. So not only, I wasn't really taking breaks, I was on the phone, although sometimes um, people would say, are you printing something? No, no. <laughs> You know, because you go chuck, 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 you know, and then I'd just talk louder. And, uh, or I'd be typing away at email. or So I constantly was working. So it was never really an issue as to whether or not uh, the company felt that I wasn't giving them the time that they needed. However, about six months, I noticed that my milk supply started going down and I wasn't getting as much. And my mother-in-law, who cares for my daughter every day, was saying, we need more milk, we need more milk. Well, she was, she was putting pressure on me. So then that would add pressure at work. So I started adding a third pumping. So I, went, I'm, I was traditionally able to do it in two, um, but then I had to go to a third. Nobody ever said anything. Nobody questioned that time that I had my door closed. Um, and the other thing that was unique about being a, a new parent after working for the organization for 10 years. I'd been a supervisor for many, many years. I'd never had one of my staff be pregnant in nursing. Well, I was very fortunate that at the same time we were pregnant, one of my employees. And so when she came back to work, um, I didn't, it came as first, um, a second nature. I didn't even think twice about allowing her. She's an hourly employee, unlike myself, who is exempt. And so I just built that into her day. If she needed to, to pump at 9.30 in the morning, even if she was at a, a position in the agency, maybe she was covering for the receptionist, I made certain that somebody else could cover for her. So I had two different perspectives at the same time. I was able to see what it was like to be a new mom myself in the organization, as well as how can I support my employee so that she can um, nurse at the times that she needed to. So I'm going to look down here and see if there's anything else that I wanted to mention. Um, <clears throat> you know, the first few weeks back to work were the most difficult because you're adjusting, as you've said, um, to being a new mom and then how to incorporate that pump schedule, as well as being flexible with my arrival time to work. Thank goodness I don't work at a position where I have to open the doors at 8 a.m. because sometimes I didn't get there till 9. Some days it'd be 9.15 because I just didn't know my child would be up numerous times throughout the evening and if I thought I was gonna nurse every day at 7 a.m., well, sometimes that didn't work. So I was very thankful that um, Cedars was willing, me to, willing to work with me to adjust my schedule so that I could meet the needs of my child and, and um, basically accomplish the biggest thing that I think I've done so far, aside from having my daughter, but is, is breastfeeding her. 
Um, another question that we were asked to answer is what can employers do to help make this work? And I think I've already addressed that with the flexible work schedule, the communication, as well as we've heard earlier today. Um, but then as a supervisor, I was able to make adjustments for my staff to make certain that they had that available time to do that. Um, the other thing that I want to mention is that I felt comfortable pumping in my office and in my workday, but for the first year that I was doing that, there were two times when I had to go to all day trainings outside of the agency. So I took it upon myself, I called wherever I was going and saying I'm a, a nursing mom, is there gonna be a room available for me? Because it was gonna be a make or, make or break decision. If they said no, which I would have been surprised, I was gonna have to tell my work, I'm sorry I can't go because I have nowhere to pump. Luckily, both of those situations came to be that they provided me a private room that I was able to do that and no questions asked. So just want to mention that sometimes things happen outside of your regular work day that you know, maybe you could provide some suggestions if your employee is concerned about, oh, what do I do? Why don't you just call them and ask and see if they have a room available? Um, how has this made me a better employee? Well, I've been in the organization for many years before I had a child, but I would say that I'm very appreciative of how supportive they are and continue to be as a new mom to me. And then it helps me to support those other new moms because we constantly are having babies born in an organization that's 85% female. And so we just need to, to keep that in the forefront of our minds. So I thank you for the opportunity to speak about my daughter, Willa, and I. Thank you. When a nursing mom returns from uh, her maternity leave, if, for example, her, the daycare or the child care provider is close to your workplace, the employer can also provide an accommodation and allow that mom to go nurse her baby rather than pump. And so I, I think that's another conversation that could happen um, if you know, it, it's not gonna take up too much time or if, you know, if your employer is flexible. I think that's completely reasonable and I think that, you know, it, it would be a great conversation to have. Uh, we had a mom that worked for a fast food restaurant without good space to pump at all, but her mother took care of her baby and it was far easier for them for her mother to zip over for 10 minutes, 15 minutes, let her nurse the baby and then, and then take off. And she could nurse the baby discreetly much more easier more easily than it was for her to find a place to pump. So that is another way of accommodation. Um, let's keep moving on. Carmen, thank you. Hi, I work for the Department of Health and Human Services and I have three kids. My oldest is four, uh, my second is two, and then he is seven months, so I'm still using the mom's room right now. And the state has been wonderfully supportive. Holly started the room for us and I'm so thankful to her. And it has been a wonderful blessing for our family. Both of my girls were breastfed for 14 months without any supplements of any kind. And my son is seven months and still getting breast milk. So it's very helpful for us. I think in listening to this, one thing that could be helpful for all of you from a mom is an actual example. Because everyone says, well, it kind of depends. So I'll tell you what works for Carmen Bockel. I don't know about the other moms. Okay, so I work from eight to 4.30. I prefer a half hour lunch so I can pick up my kids early. So when I'm pumping, I split my, in my mind, it's two 15 minute breaks and a half hour lunch. I split that into three 20 minutes, give or take, and I use all of those for the mother's room. Now these people that also get to go to lunch, I'm a little jealous of them, I never thought of that. <laughs> I see it at my desk. But that has worked for me. It, I find that it takes me 22 minutes to use the mom's room, to get from my desk over there. I wash out my parts before I go back and I always run my pump for at least 12 minutes, regardless. That's just what I've always done to maintain supply. So that's what's worked for me. So if that kind of gives you a sense of an idea of what it could be, I never have gone more than three hours without feeding a baby or pumping during the day. So the moms that are working four or five hour shifts and not using one, I feel so bad for them <laughs> because that would be painful. I mean, it's not just something that you wanna do because it's emotionally wonderful and it's good for your baby and everything, but it's also something that you physically have to do <laughs> because if you feed a baby all the time and you go to work and you're not feeding them, you can be in pain in a matter of time. So it's a matter for your physical wellness to be able to go and take care of your mom duties and then come back to work. I think another thing to think about is the fact that most working moms are probably your best employees because leaving that baby at home, <laughs> not easy for anybody. So I think if they're there, they wanna be there and they'll make it work and they'll do what they have to do. So I think that's all I have. Um, my name is Liz Ring Carlson. I'm the public affairs manager out at State Farm, and I've been at State Farm for 15 years. 
Uh, this is a picture of my oldest. She's now five, but that's Britta Grace. And then I have a three-year-old, um, Annika Rose, and then I'm expecting a little guy here this July. <laughs> Um, for me, I would say, um, I agree with you, um, child labor was hard, but breastfeeding for me was harder, and Milkworks played a big role in my success in being a nursing mom, um, but I also have to credit my employer. Um, like you, I have an office, and so um, State Farm has lactation rooms in both of our buildings for our employees, and we have a lot of women who work at State Farm. In fact, I think in my department, we've had 11 babies in three years, so... Um, there's a lot of babies happening out there. <laughs> and so I wanted to leave the lactation rooms available for employees, so I just used my office. And I um, would make a little picture of Britta on the door, um, or Annika, and just said, mommy time. And so when I needed to pump, I put that sign by the doorknob so that no one would come in and people knew what I was doing and they respected that fact. And um, having a, women, a department of all women, I think that they really um, admired the fact that I made my family a priority and modeled the behavior um, that's important to me as well as to them. Um, I also did email, caught up on reading, all of that during my time where I was pumping um, so that I could be as efficient as possible um, for the company. I felt like I wanted to give that extra discretionary effort since State Farm was being so accommodating to me as a new mom. Um, they also let me take my baby on some business trips. I had some huge projects that were um, coming to a head right when I returned to work. So um, Britta and my mom traveled with me across the country several times to um, represent the company at various events. And um, my mom did what you described with a fast food worker on, the, on some of those occasions where she'd bring the baby in and when there would be a break at the conference and I'd run out and nurse her and come back to the meeting and like nothing happened. <laughs> at that time, I thought I was really Wonder Woman because I was producing milk and running a meeting. <laughs> um, but um, I do think it made me a more loyal employee. Um, I've been there 15 years and it's made me a more empathetic manager. Um, I feel like that discretionary effort that I've continued to give the company has paid off. I've been promoted several times since I started having kids. And uh, we do have a family-friendly environment at State Farm, and I think that's something that um, I feel proud to say because I lived it. Um, other things I would mention, um, I think it also helped me um, being a nursing mom, making me more confident and healthy upon returning to work. You are sleep deprived, but at the same time, you're losing weight, you're feeling like you're helping your baby, um, you feel like you're making a good health decision for your baby, but also for your own health. So I think that all plays into the kind of that emotional roller coaster you're feeling after you have a baby that you can, um, you know, take care of your family, take care of work responsibilities, take care of um, your wife responsibilities and all of that. So I think overall, it's not a balancing act. I've always said it's an integration. And for me, uh, pumping at work was the prime example of integrating motherhood and work together. And um, I think that um, if you are thinking about how to do this, um, there's tons of resources in Lincoln. Milkworks is a great one to, to, to check with, but making that space available for your, um, your women employees is important and um, helping them figure out how to balance that juggling act throughout the day just through good conversation will really help um, you retain some great women employees. Any questions for the panelists? We've got a few minutes. Yeah, absolutely, Sarah. Um, I just wanted to make a note of when you had mentioned the lunch and then um, the reason, and also with us, with me saying that, you know, I, we want our employees to take this time and stress free and with the loyal, uh, loyalty of the employees, it's funny because I've actually had to try and now talk some of the women out of not working because they really feel the dedication to what they're doing mm -hmm. and they are very, um, they just have that loyalty to uh, their, their employer to get everything done. They're so happy that they have a place. During one of the focus groups, one of the moms even said, well, I'm just happy I have a place that's not a bathroom, or I'm happy I'm not sitting on the floor. So, you know, which appalled me because that was her last workplace. And the other thing with the lunch, if you can make it available, nutrition is so important to a breastfeeding mom. And if she's going to try and pound something down while she's nursing, it might not be really good for her. <laughs> so trying to make sure that she understands how much nutrition is important during breastfeeding is really, really important too. Those are very good ideas. 
You know, as we talk about these accommodations, one thing that I always like to say to a mom, too, when we're working on helping her to breastfeed is you don't have to do this for 20 years. <laughs> you know, you're really talking about very short-term accommodations for this employee that has lifelong benefits for that baby, for her, and also, if you think of it, if her children have left less infections, she's going to be less absent from the workforce, even once her kids are not breastfeeding. So it really does have a long-term impact. Other questions? Yes. Yeah, so the question is, if the building she's in does not have accommodations, um, can she be expected to have to walk to another building? Reasonable, reasonableness is sort of what we, what do we all think? Who thinks that's reasonable? Who doesn't think it's reasonable? You know, that, that's the best answer that maybe we have right now. Um, you know, if they're willing to give you that time to, to walk 10 minutes and go to that, that building, I, you know, I don't know. I mean, this is a, a difficult concept to, to grasp, but it looks like everyone in the room says probably not but open a conversation. Yes. What I think is exciting about the fact that this um, language is in the bill is that now there'll be all these different lactation rooms across the city. So when you are at a conference at the university or um, you are down at the state capitol doing part of your job, there'll be rooms available for new moms. I can remember shortly after Britta was born, I had to be down at the, at the legislature and there were no rooms to pump. And so Senator Conrad was like, just use my office. So I'm pumping in a, in a you know, Nebraska senator's office, but that's what was available. And so I think that's what's neat about this um, language in the law, that there'll be space available for moms who might not be employees, but um, are utilizing the buildings across the city. It's a great way to think of it. And another way you can reach out to people that are coming into your work site. Yes. If, if you as an employee want to do that, I think that the employer can allow you to do that. Now, if, the, if, the, if you go to the employer and say, um, I need to pump, and your employer says, go to your car, you need to say, whoa, you know, <laughs> let's look at 207R. Right. Um, but if you choose that, I mean, this is, again, back... Five years from now, if we have another one of these meetings, I'll be able to give you all sorts of information. I guarantee it, because this, the, this language is going to be tested. It's going to go in front of the Lancaster County Court. It's going to go in front of the federal courts. And we're going to have some context to put this in. We're going to have some examples. But until that occurs, this is really just, you know, um, this is why we're saying employers and employees get together. You know, get something that works for both of you. We do have women who are traveling as part of their job, uh, public health nurses, uh, visiting nurses, who they do oftentimes will pump in their car. They want to because that's the most convenient thing for them to do. So, again, it's what, what accommodation does the employee want to make. If that's comfortable for her, that's a, a, true po that's a possibility. Any other questions? Do you want to, um, Holly, do you want to go into the resources thing? One of the things we want to make sure you know about is that uh, as I mentioned, there are good resources in our city and our state for breastfeeding moms, for employers, for the whole community when it comes to working with moms. Um, you have some great resources that we've put together that are in your packet for you to take home. What we really wanted to do today was motivate, personalize, kind of put, put some faces on what this looks like. But you have lots of great information in your packet. Um, the... Um, uh, womenshealth.gov has great resources, U.S. Department of Labor, U.S. Breastfeeding Committee, all of these are accessible um, through the internet. Um, I don't need to talk anymore really about Milkworks. There's brochures here, but we are a community breastfeeding center. We've been here for 11 years. And um, we do have return to work events for moms that we've been doing for about eight or nine years. We do it two or three times a year. Um, it's a free event that we have for moms. We have a panel of moms. This was kind of duplicated off of it. We have a, um, e um, a listserv um, for moms as well as a class in a group. 
Um, and also the Nebraska Breastfeeding Coalition, which is a wonderful, um, very strong group that's been in for about three years now has been active, two to three years, and they have a great website as well. So there are some good resources in the city and in the state for you um, to turn to. Thank you all very much for coming today. Very enthusiastic about the new um, laws in place in Nebraska, first of all, about public breastfeeding and certainly the federal law, which supports moms in returning to the workplace. Um, we have been working with businesses, particularly um, because I work in the WIC office at the Central District Health Department in Grand Island. Um, the moms that we see in my office, um, particularly uh, over 80% of them are working outside of the home. And they're working in the types of businesses where it may be problematic. Uh, to return to work because of part-time, because of shifts, because of uh, the, the actual location of the business and the type of work that they're doing. But today um, at your meeting, I was really encouraged about uh, the variety of panelists and, and the ways that they um, saw how to make it work. And I really think that it's something as a state, Nebraska, that we're looking at and we're putting um, not only a lot uh, the law into effect, but a lot of positive enthusiasm. So not only is it something that we should be doing because it's the law, um, people are actually accommodating this because it makes sense. Because we've been putting some extra emphasis on this at our WIC program and providing electric pumps and that type of thing, so reducing another barrier that they don't have the equipment to turn to work, return to work, or they don't have the coverage uh, to provide for a pump through their insurance or their, their Medicaid, um, we are able to provide a pump for them to go back to work at places like Mm, I'm, I'm thinking of Fazoli's, <laughs> which is a fast food type uh, Italian um, place of business that I think is across Nebraska virtually, uh, certainly locations across Nebraska. And this mom worked part time. Um, her manager um, became aware of the situation that she was going to be breastfeeding. Uh, they discussed it during her pregnancy, and he accommodated, set aside a room. Uh, changed the lock on it so that it was something that would be completely private and her co-employees, her peers in the organization were very accommodating. She generally worked in the takeout area, in the drive through and they would fill in for her. In fact, they would remind her. So it was really a, a business effort. She didn't feel isolated, which I think some women do. They don't want to talk about it, or they are fr frightened, they feel intimidated. Um, and in this particular case, it turned out to be a real positive thing that she became much closer to her fellow employees. So uh, we thought that was fabulous. Um, another example that I like to highlight is The Buckle, which is another Nebraska-based business that has gone national. And uh, a mom of ours went in to ask to breastfeed, and the... Um, the employee, and the employees that all work there are very young, said, oh, hey, you guys, code white, code white. And she thought that meant I'm going to get, you know, um, patted down or wanted or something. And she took her back to an area where they wrap gifts behind the counter at, um, back behind the, the area. And we talked to the manager about that then. We went in, this mom reported that she was very accommodated as a as a customer. So we went in and talked to her about an as an employee. And, and she, as the manager, went, I, I breastfed all my kids. And so I tell my employees, hey, if I'm going to be pumping or if the dad has brought in one of the kids for me to breastfeed, I'm going to say code white. And that means leave me alone <laughs> for 30 minutes. Now, what I saw that as, what a wonderful example to her very young employees that she was surrounded by, I, I submitted that story to the corporate office, the Buckle office, and she was recognized nationally um, as not only for customer service, but certainly for employee um, service. And, and I think those kinds of things are, we're seeing more and more. It, it's not just in a corporate office, but in those smaller businesses those kind of locations that if the employee is making it an effort, 
um, with their manager. I think it's communication, and um, it works out for both of them, Great. and all of us in the long run. Um, we are in our th the third year of the BEST grant, which again is the Breastfeeding Education Support and Training Grant. And what we have been working on in that grant is, is four arms. So we've been working with small businesses um, to, uh, for lactation spaces, hospitals surrounding hospital policy, training physicians, and then um, peer counselors, breastfeeding support for peer counselors. And to focus for, for this purposes, we'll focus on the small business. But what we have done in Omaha is we've been working with small businesses to assess the culture in, in Omaha. What is the culture of small businesses surrounding lactation support in, in the small businesses, 1 to 99 employees? In year um, one, which is in 2009, we went and assessed small businesses and found that overwhelmingly they supported the right of moms to breastfeed. 91% of them supported, um, with or without policies, the right of women to express milk. On the flip side, only about 23% of those had policies in place. So there's a big disconnect. There's support for services, but yet there's no policies that exist. The other thing that we found was about 85% of them allowed mothers to express in a private space, but that also did include bathroom spaces. So we know we're working with a, a group that is um, interested in providing the resource for moms, but they don't have the policies to support them. In the Omaha area, one success story that sticks out right away is the Omaha Chamber of Commerce. Um, they have a human resources coordinator there by the name of Lori Piper, and she is pro-breastfeeding. She is um, a grandma, and I think that has a lot, um, that really holds a lot of support. And she has, at both of her offices, um, she's creating in her west office now a lactation space, but has already in their main office created a space. And she feels that the benefit is just tremendous. And what the chamber has opted to do is in this first year, just use that support for internal employees. Advertise it, promote it, use the service. But what the chamber hopes to do in this next year is to open that up to the, to the public. For all of those people that are coming into the chamber for meetings, for different types of events. So she really has taken this idea, has fostered it within her organization, and now is going to open it up to the community. And she is such an advocate, and I think that that really was one of the things we've learned for this grant, is you need an advocate in your um, organization to make this successful. One of the most important things that we heard from employers and employees today was the importance of starting the discussion early, so that if an employer can initiate a discussion with an employee during their pregnancy as to how they might anticipate accommodating them when they return to work while they're breastfeeding, it relieves a huge amount of anxiety on both the part of the employer and the employee, so that they know exactly how the accommodations might be made and how, what the mother can expect when she returns to work as an employee. It actually helps her to anticipate returning to work with a more positive attitude and really makes it easier on both sides. I did this same presentation about seven or eight years ago for WorkWell, and we had eight businesses in attendance. It is incredibly encouraging to see how eight years later um, we had 80 to 90 employers here in attendance today. Um, that's absolutely encouraging when we look at the progress that we're making in terms of public health and making sure that infant nutrition and the long-term health status of our community members counts. It was very fascinating as I listened to the moms today who've returned to work while breastfeeding, how important they found it to credit their employer with help making this work for them. It is so much easier for them to return to the workforce when they know that they're also protecting the health of their infant at the same time. And their appreciation was a wonderful part of he hearing what they had to say today.